Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode number 11. I'm your host, Derek Moore, and today we're going to be talking about why interest rates are important to stock market investors. You know, I've been getting a lot of questions about the recent rise in rates. Of course, we all know that the federal funds rate or the Federal Reserve Bank has been raising what's affectionately known as the Fed funds rate, which of course is the rate at which banks can lend to one another uh, as they need reserves. But they actually mean something to stock investors, potentially devaluations, and um, there's any number of ways that rates are important. And so today I'll kind of touch on a couple things that you may or may not be thinking about, of course, some of the easy ones. And we'll kind of end up with uh, a little bit on how interest rates really affect different facets of the economy. And so, of course, I mentioned the Fed funds rate. We know that as the Federal Reserve raises rates, and that raising of rates certainly adjusts or affects the short end of the curve. Remember that yield curve looks at the short end, meaning the shortest duration, out to the longest end. But anytime they do that, it's going to change uh, what people use for discount rates. It's going to change maybe what you're paying for uh, a car loan, a credit card, and things like that. And so obviously, the easy ones, and you're probably thinking, well, why are you going to cover home loans or car loans? But I'll go through these quickly and just to show you sort of the the difference between paying one way rate and paying another. You know, the first thing you kind of look at is, okay, if I was going to spend $30,000 or take a loan out for a $30,000 uh, you know, car, and I'm going to finance that amount, and I'm going to do it at 3.11% for 60 months, you'll wind up paying about $541 a month would be you know, roughly your, your monthly car payment. And because you financed that $30,000, and let's assume you didn't put anything down, roughly you'll wind up spending about $32,400 and change for the car. But if we raise rates, let's say we, we raise the rate to 8%, well, now your payment goes from 541 to 608 a month, and that's for 60 months. But you'll be paying, instead of the 32, your total payments, including the, the interest and the principal, would be roughly 36498 And so you're probably saying, look, that's a pretty obvious one. When we get to home loans, it's still the same thing. Obviously, the higher the interest rate that you're paying, the more your monthly payment will go up. To, to give you an idea, though, about how this changes things, let's say that you took a home loan for 400000 and you did a 30-year loan. And you ran the numbers and you said, well, you know, 30-year right now is about 3.92%. It's actually been lower, but obviously rates have come up recently. And you say, okay, well, your monthly payment, not including, you know, all some other things like insurance and, and taxes and things like that, would be roughly, you know, $1,891. If you rose the rate by 100 basis points or 1%, remember a 1% increase, is a 100 basis point increase. And so if you go from you know, 3.92 to 3.93, you're going up a basis point. If you go from 3.92 to 4.92%, you're going up 100 basis points. And if you do that, now your payment jumps from 1891 to 2128. You go up to 8%, wow, that would be quite a, quite a big increase. Uh, but just to give you a comparison, at 8%, your payment's over $1,000 higher than it would have been at, at 3.92 at 29.35. And so obviously, as interest rates go up, the cost of loans go up. And you know potentially, what you're financing or what you have the ability to buy is also can be changed around as well. And so again, you're probably like, I didn't tune in to figure out that home loans and car loans will go up in value as interest rates go up, you're like, Derek, I, I already know that. I didn't need the podcast. And sure, maybe this is some information that you can share with your friends and, and help them understand. But then think about how this might affect potentially some of the other economic things. You know, As interest rates go up, in theory, your house affordability is affected. As interest rates go up, uh, the type, you know, how much uh, car you can buy, that could be affected. So there, there are some some things that could have some economic implications, sort of say. But when we think about, you know, the, the idea of a stock market investor and what they're concerned about with regards to, to interest rates, and there's, there's really a couple things to kind of think about here. 
And when we value a stock, and look, I mean, a valuation of a stock, it's really about supply and demand. So where a stock trades is a function of supply and demand, meaning if there's more demand for the shares, price will go up. If there's less demand, price will go down. And momentum, sentiment, all those things play into how a stock price moves around. And But there are people out there who are trying to value a company. And part of the way that they value a company is they try and figure out, okay, we think that they are going to earn this much money in a year from now, this much in two years, and this much in three years. And they have what's called earnings estimates. Are those estimates always correct? No, of course not. Of course not. And especially the further you go out, the less certainty there is. But they're trying to value a company based upon the estimation of what the future cash flows, meaning earnings, are going to be. And part of what the exercise is on that is you've got a discount down uh, by a discount rate or an interest rate down from the future value to the present value. And so many of you probably went through this in a finance class or an economics class, but it's sort of worth repeating. And when we say we have, we're going to get a payment, uh, that payment is sometime in the future. Let's say we're going to get a payment of $100,000 one year from today. And so what we've got to do is we've got to look at and say, okay, we're going to get the money in a year. Um, and essentially, you know, if we made an investment maybe or you know, whatever it is, we wouldn't have had the benefit of, of earning interest over that year. And so we've got to discount that down. And to give you an example, if we're going to get a payment of, let's say, $100,000 in one year, and the interest rate is only 1%. And you know sometimes people use the risk-free rate. The risk-free rate on a three-month treasury, U.S. Treasury right now is 2.31%. Uh, there's different, you know, of course, uh, you know, different ways to do to use the discount rate. But let's say we did it at 1%. Well, that $100,000 payment will receive in one year discount rate of 1%, the present value what that future payment is worth at a 1% discount is $99,009.90. Okay, probably didn't need the cents, but you get the idea. But if we were to take that discount rate and instead of making it 1%, now we made it 10%, what happens is that future payment in one year where we're going to receive $100,000, when we discount that down to the present value, Instead of being worth $99,000, we'll call it $10, now it's only worth $90,909. And so quite a bit difference in the present value of that payment or that cash flow that we're going to receive in one year. And again, the higher the discount rate, the lower the present value of that future cash flow is. And so this becomes important not only for how we value you know, value stocks, but it also matters for sort of uh, the way that companies or individuals might invest capital. And so one of the calculations that if a business or somebody was going to look at the interest rate, that interest rate provides sort of a, a hurdle of the return that they need to get before they might invest in a project. And so if interest rates are 2% and they're going to get you know, 6% or 5%, well, maybe that's something they might do. But if interest rates are much higher, like 10%, 11%, then the required rate of return on any type of investment capital goes up and maybe a project is not greenlit. And quite frankly, I mean, this, this is one of the reasons why you hear people who are talking about, did the Fed keep interest rates artificially low? Um, did they mess with them a little bit too much? One of the things that they bring up is when interest rates are really low, in fact, we had essentially Fed funds rate at 0.25 for the better part of 10 years. Well, when you've got a, really a zero interest rate, uh, the hurdle or the required return is very low compared to that interest rate. In fact, in places like Sweden, in Italy, in Germany, in France, and some other countries, Japan, the short end of the curve still has negative rates, meaning in theory, you would 
pay interest, not receive it on a bond. It, it's a little more complicated than that. And so in, in Europe, the with the negative rates on the short term, it's a, a different picture. But anyway, so back to the the idea of this investment capital and then what type of return you need to get. There's a there's something that that people do. It's called a, a net present value. And, and net present value basically just says, if we're going to get money in the future, we're going to get payments in the future, or earnings in the future, and we need to discount that down to the to today. Remember, we did that that future value and we used the discount rate. And we brought it down. Well, what is that money worth? And then the net present value exercise looks at what the initial investment was. And so let's uh, let's use an example. Let's say somebody took sixty thousand dollars and they invested it in some sort of investment. And the first year, the the cash flow was twenty thousand. The second year was twenty two thousand. So not bad, about a ten percent increase in the cash flow. And the third year was twenty five thousand dollars. And so, you know, the idea is that that's uh, you know sixty seven thousand dollars paid over three years. The present value of that at a ten percent discount rate would be about fifty five thousand, you know, one forty seven or so. And but the thing is, though, you then use this function and you decide, okay, is does the project actually a positive or negative when you include the amount you invested and what's called the net present value? And that project would have a negative forty eight hundred dollar net present value. And so, you know, it's a Without complicating things too much, uh, the textbook would say, okay, don't do that project because it's got a negative uh, net present value. What's interesting though, and remember interest rates, it's not only about mortgage rates and car loan rates and about you know getting all sorts of loans and, and business loans at lower rates to try and drive investment, but lower rates can also make a project uh, that wouldn't have qualified at a higher interest rate to be greenlit, meaning to to have uh, go ahead and do it, uh, it could actually make it, um, you know, qualify for the investment. So, in our same example before, just looking at those three cash flows and changing nothing else but the interest rate from ten percent down to three percent, well, then our present value goes from fifty five thousand one forty six to sixty three thousand thirty three, and instead of being a negative net present value of forty eight hundred. It's a positive three thousand thirty-three. Um, you know, it, in the the back of the napkin, the the sort of uh, you know real simple example, it would say, well, it qualifies in theory because it's got a a positive value when you discount down all the cash flows at a ten percent interest rate. It did not, and so that's a good example of you know when you look at interest rates and how they can affect whether or not projects get done, whether or not something qualifies. Uh, of course, the riskiness of the, of the project matters. And, um, you know, maybe you wouldn't do a project if you, if you only get a, a few percentage points above the risk-free rate if you deem the project more uh, risky as far as future cash flows. But you can kind of see that, you know, for, for the markets and for, you know, we look at sort of the economic activity, Low rates is more than just what you pay on a car loan. You also have this function of where projects are getting done or not done based upon the required rate of return and what the, the cost of capital is and what investors are requiring um, as a return based upon the interest rate. And this all brings us to, to how people may value a stock. And remember, there's any number of ways to value a stock. And as I said before, stocks go up or down because of supply and demand, because of really momentum and more buyers than sellers, it's going to go up, more sellers than buyers, it's going to go down. And there's the the famous quote that markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent, meaning you might value something at a certain level and, and you might deem it overvalued and, and take a position against it. But markets can stay overvalued or undervalued for a while. And as the saying says, longer than you can stay solvent. People have lost money you know, going on one direction or another based upon what they perceive to be the right value. But think about it this way. This is where we bring it back full circle. If you're looking at a stock valuation, a stock's valuation in, in large part, if you were going to use a fundamental analysis, you'd say, well, 
we've got to look at the future cash flows and we've got to figure out and discount those down to the present value to come up with some sort of valuation. And that that's a little bit of an oversimplified uh, explanation. But when we say a stock, you say, okay, we're going to get earnings next year of X. You're going to get earnings in year two. And these are all estimates. Estimates, of course, can change. We believe the company will earn free cash flow or earnings uh, net income in, in year two. And then they'll also get some, some earnings in year three. And so we talked about how the higher the interest rate, uh, the less those future earnings are actually worth. And to give you an example, and this is actually from one of the chapters in my book, I'll certainly link to this, I'll look, link to some other resources on the, uh, on the show notes. But if we had, let's say, a, a stock, and we'll call it XYZ, XYZ, not a real stock, I, I, at least I don't think it is. And so XYZ, let's say, is going to have earnings of $100,000 in a year from now, and then they're going to grow 10%. So year two, they'll get $110,000 in, uh, in free cash flow or earnings. And then year three, they'll grow 10% again, a uh, nice steady growth rate, and they'll return 121000 in earnings. So over three years, you're talking about earnings of $331,000. But remember, you've got to discount down um, those years. And remember, years two will have be discounted over two years. Year three will be discounted over three years. You've got to discount those future earnings down to the present value. And so if interest rates were only 1%, you know, you're looking at roughly uh, a present value of about 325000 or so, give or take, which is almost all of the the 331,000 in total earnings. And so since interest rates were so low, they didn't really have to be discounted down much. And so in theory, a stock could value the earnings um, almost almost all the way of what their, their future value is. But if you go from 1% to 3%, then the, the present value of those future cash flows is only roughly three hundred and twelve thousand. I'm sort of estimating, you know, based upon a chart I had in the book. Five uh, percent around three hundred thousand. At seven percent, they're only worth about two hundred eighty-eight thousand, uh, give or take. And so the point of me going through this is, interest rates matter for different parts of the markets, different parts of the economy. But as you can see, when in theory you need to value a stock and discount the future cash flows back. The higher the rate, the less those future cash flows are worth. And so that's somewhat important in, in the stock market. And the other thing, too, is, well, some people might say, well, wait a second. If interest rates are going up and earnings are uh, going to be worth less, doesn't that mean that you know stocks aren't really worth that much anymore? Here's the thing. What you don't know, number one, these are estimates. You don't know what the future is going to bring. And the second thing is, Stocks earnings could grow more than the uh, increase in the amount that has to be discounted. So you could still see on a on a net present value, um, the valuations go higher because earnings are going higher. And so there's a lot of things that are fluid in this. But I wanted to do a quick episode because I've been getting some questions on, hey, what does rising rates mean to different parts of the market? Uh, and then of course you got to remember the big thing with regards to interest rates is what happens to the market value of a bond. And so as interest rates go up, bonds go down. It's that seesaw, the inverse thing. Rates go up, bonds go down. And so unlike the late 70s, where you were paying very, very high interest rates, coupon payments were very high and you had rates going higher, bonds had a big cushion because if, if bonds are paying 10% a year, and then the, the change in interest rates makes bonds lose 10%. Well, in theory, you're, you're breaking even. But if you start out, let's say, at a 3% interest rate and the rates go up a lot, well, you don't have as much interest to offset the change in the market value. And so we've talked about bonds before, and maybe we'll do a whole episode just about bonds and, and how interest rates affect bonds. But that is a, also a very, very big thing to, to keep an eye on. And year to date... It's interesting, the aggregate bond index, the U.S. aggregate bond index, uh, which is AGG is sort of the symbol of the ETF, 
Um, that was down year to date roughly, you know, between four and four and a half percent. Since 1980, I don't remember it being down that much. But the thing is, bonds are, with the interest rates so low, any sort of change in interest rates is going to affect those bond prices because you don't have those very large coupon payments. And so maybe we'll do a, a whole separate episode, uh, really getting into the, the details and uh, uh, the fine details, should we say, of how bonds change based upon interest rates because I've also been getting a lot of questions on that. So I will uh, I will link to a few things and also look for an article. Uh, I'll probably do an update where I'll play around with the Buffett indicator, which looks at the stock market divided by the nominal GDP to try and figure out when the market, and this is according to people who follow this, um, where the market is based upon valuation, because um, that is indiscriminate to interest rates and I think interest rates matter with regards to valuations. And certainly one of the biggest bull markets we ever had was 1982 to 1999 when rates went from, you, know, you could have bought a 15% treasury bond in 82 and then rates went down to next to nothing after the financial crisis. So let's, uh, let's call it there. Uh, we'll be back next week with another topic and see everyone then. Take care.